Okay, so I said before lunch that we uh, have that we have our um, quality of service TSN session now, and that after lunch we'll go deeper into um, shaping and the like. And to start the topic, we actually start with the motivation for shaping, and it's a presentation that was. Um, done by Don Pennell, who unfortunately also wasn't able to travel um, due to travel restrictions. And from NXP, uh, he has a long time experience in all the TSN, IEEE 802.1, 1722 and the like standardization efforts. But um, as he's not there, we have a a uh, very good uh, replacement for him, and that's uh, his colleague Manfred Kunz, who is the chief system architect for the automotive solutions, who will give the presentation instead. So a warm welcome to Manfred, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Kirsten. So yeah, uh, as Kirsten mentioned, uh, Don and myself, uh, we work together since uh, in the last two decades in two different companies uh, together, but we work on uh, network solutions. I was more and on the talker side and what the talker is, we will talk uh, later on in the presentation, Don more on the switching side, later on we made a combined device with a ECU and switch. But that's where it came from, and we always had some discussions uh, during all the time, before AVB, during AVB, and then also uh, with the new TSN standards. So we'll talk about the challenges and the historical solutions, today's solutions, and the summary. So here an overview of the challenges of a mixed data read network. I mean, luckily, we have now uh, Automotify standardized from 10 megabit up to 10 gigabit. If we o when we only had 100 megabit, the life was easier, let's say, and not as complicated. Now, this congestion and what we will talk about is more obvious. So, because it gives a designer the option to have 10 megabit where he needs 10 megabit and up to 10 gig gigabit where he needs it. So. We see here a classic client-server architecture model where bridges are used to connect uh, the links and we have slower links which then are connected into bridges, bridges, multiple bridges into another bridge and then they can talk to the server and the server can talk to everyone assuming that he has enough horsepower to talk to everyone and uh, up to the link speed he's connected to. But typical, like a server is an, SC, an uh, ECU, could be a, a micro or a mi processor, microcontroller, depending on the speed. So we will use this kind of model uh, throughout the presentation to show uh, the methods available and to mitigate uh, drop packets due to congestion here. So the problem here is congestion points. Congestion points occur wherever the rate entering into a port and the rate where the is of exiting the port is different. So here we see, for example, a rate change of P1 with one gigabit coming into a bridge and then it's supposed to go out on one of the three uh, 100 megabit ports. So this is a rate of 10 to 1. So that is something which could happen in the past. It also could happen in the past if you would have two 100 megabit ports like P3 and P2 and they all send data to P1, so it's a 2 to 1 congestion. It doesn't fit, so you cannot get more uh, in, uh, in and then uh, you drop frames. So the TXQ buffers are typically shock absorber and they are designed to have some momentarity congestion and to, to absorb for that but not for a constant congestion or a constant different frame rate there. So if that congestion is too long, the buffers will fill up and packets will be dropped because that's what a bridge does. If the buffers are filled up, it starts dropping ingress frames. So 10 base T1S ports 
are congestion ports, even if data entering the 10 base T1S ports buffer is 10 megabit. It is because 10 megabit is a shared media. Uh, so there we definitely will have congestions if the people want to, everyone wants, would like to send at line rate. So here the challenges. So it's not, sorry. Historical solutions. When Don and I worked on that, and I was building the ECU side, I said, come, come on, we have something there, we can rely on TCP IP. And that was solving it for enterprise Ethernet pretty good. We say, okay, when, the server, when we start as a server to send, and uh, to send to the nodes P, K, and B, for example, here, with different TX rates, due to the different link speeds, TCP IP would start with bursting of packets to each node. If the node gets an act back, then it will increase the burst side until the node replies, NAC, okay, I didn't receive it. So the server knows I lost something. I have to go down and that's how you more or less regulate your speed. The benefit is that as a server, you can send data to a lot of nodes back to back and utilize the link bandwidth as well as dynamic adjust the network's link ut utilization. The problem is it is slow to stabil stabilize a rate. It's non-deterministic. And what is something which we had to learn in automotive is not excused. It is relying on dropping packets. So only if I get a knock back, I can adjust my rate. That means I need retransmission of lost data. And in a lot of use cases, losing data, uh, for example, for streams, is not something which matches to the requirements of automotive. So the second thing which we also used heavily in uh, enterprise Ethernet uh, was, okay, give me a pause frame back to the server and I know, okay, you cannot receive anymore, so I'll stop transmission. It is a well-known and heavily used uh, technique in enterprise networks. So the benefit is I wouldn't drop packets as long as I can ensure I get the pause frame before I restart my next frame and uh, the round trip time is okay. The problem is if you look at these different links here, a pause frame to a server will stop all frames from the server. So if you start from the edge in this example, while well, you have node B on uh, the left side and the buffer fills, it will pass to the second bridge. The second bridge will fill and it will pass to the server. The server will pass all transmissions, also to P and K over there. So this is really then slowing down the server to send at the slowest speed to 10 megabit instead only the one flow which is going for over the bridges in the past. So that wasn't the solution. So then we went further ahead in enterprise Ethernet and said, okay, then give us priority-based flow control. So priority-based flow control, you still get pause frames, but the pause frames are coming back with a priority in it. So you stop only one priority and proceed to send other priorities because there are designated priority queues on the receiver. The benefit is, is really we stop only one flow and one priority. The negative is it stops everything in that class. So if you have multiple flows going in that class, everything for that traffic class will be stopped. So also not a perfect solution. So here are a short summary of the mechanisms I was talking. So the first one, TCP IP slow start. It's great, doesn't work for UDP, does lose packets. The second one, MAC pause frames. It's inside the box, it's okay, but outside over a whole network like this structure here, it's creating problems. The priority base, we also discussed about it. It is stopping, not flows, it's stopping traffic classes and traffic classes and priorities and everything inside of that. But in my server, I have a ton of flows per tri priority class and not only one flow per class. So that's creating my problem that I stop everything. 
how do I get some flows through and others not? So that was the question here. And uh, debating with Dawn at the end, then he came up and said, but we have a solution in TSN for that, for this network. But it needs to be implemented on the server side. That will be the point. So the intention was, look at what TCP IP was doing good. So it scales per end station and per, per nodes. It uh, adjusts the buffering and the transmission rate per independent flows. So it's really per flow where I regulate and make sure that I get my traffic through. It lo uh, works in a small network, in a big network, and each station talking uh, is really responsible to scale the flows and to limit the flows. And as we have here, it works in a simple bridge, but it also works in 10,000 uh, flows per bridge. So they don't need to be, uh, f bridges don't need to be flow aware. It is just the talker who needs to be flow aware for this model of TCP IP. So as we said, independent flows, no need on the bridge to be aware of it. And uh, then the major drawback is there, which is not acceptable in automotive, which is really losing packets. So we need a deterministic solution. We need to ensure that we don't lose packets and we have a mechanism to ensure that. So the question is really, can we keep, keep the good part of it and can we solve the problem of losing packets and retransmission in TCP IP? Then this is something uh, Don brought up and said, okay, but look, there is uh, a solution for that and it is already defined. So when uh, the problem was there of the first shapers with AVB and the first uh, TSN profiles, whatever was implemented, uh, it was already solved. So the solution needed to support non-TCP IP flows, as we said, a lot of sensor data are uh, UDP based uh, multicast and it doesn't help me if I get a video picture again after retransmission, if I already missed it in the first place or a sensor information so it's not acceptable and by reducing the stress on the buffers of the network congestion points the bridges for a given class of flow so cbs was defined for that but then everyone says yes cbs is is clear so that's credit based shaping which ensures no packets are dropped due to congestion by adding specific requirements to the end station. And that is something a lot of people are not aware. There is a clause five in IEEE, which is specific for talkers, for end stations. Support the operation of the credit-based shaper algorithm as the transmission selection algorithm used for frames transmitted for each stream associated with the SR class. So it's not each traffic class, it's per flow per stream. And that's already defined over there. So this additional requirement performs a per flow shaping to limit the flow transmissions independently like TCP IP, followed by a per class shaper to deburst uh, each class's data. So this is the, the per class shaper is a common requirement for talkers and bridges. The per flow shaper over per class shaping is one for talkers and it's defined but it's if you go around in the majority of the micros out there you will not find that implementation and people will claim okay i have problems lose packets and ha don't have a clean end-to-end -end solution the end-to-end -end solution is defined in ieee and is standardized so here is an overview how it's supposed to work. This is more a systematic overview, how you implement the queues in your hardware or in your software and how you do that. This is more the flow model, how it should work from a system point of view. So it shows the exact CBS requirements of a talker. The classes over there, uh, like class A, B, C, D, have the same structure per flow rate limiting by CBS and then merging into traffic class queue where the aggregate is debursed by the traffic classes. So if you look, only class A is here as an example. Every class will have additional flow queues 
over there, but that's just an example for a class A, uh, which is there. And then the, the statement since automotive is outside the AVB profile, BA, automotive can even define more AVB uh, two classes like A and B. So that is something what is needed and can be defined there. So this model, there are many ways to implement. As you see, as I say, buffer for flow one to four are needed. If these are hardware or if, if these are virtual, it's your decision and how your trigger, your interrupts, your, your arbiter is working and where you place it. So when the frames at the end come to the Mac and from the Mac to the wire, uh, that's important how that's handled. And the, the structure is really, you have per flow, put every flow in a separate one, then the arbiter puts the flows accordingly into the class shaper, and then it goes with the selector uh, into the Mac. So that is the structure of it. A normal way would be you would only have class shapers. That's what a lot of t uh, Macs or end stations uh, claim when they say they have TSN support. They have only class shapers and they put everything in a class. But uh, for, for what that creates as a risk, we will talk, talk later. So here is uh, a good example to show what it means, uh, why uh, the flow shaping uh, in a talker is required in a talker and not in a bridge. So you see here uh, different flows, so a class A flow, uh, which is going to the end station B at 2 megabit, a second flow which is going to K with 20 megabit, and a third to end station P with 200 megabit, all on the same class. So a total of 222 megabit for class A. So the class A setting for that would be if you would only have a class A, so a shaper, 222 megabit, the aggregate of all the, the three flows for the same traffic class, which need to go out. So, if without any per flow shaper, what would happen in a server? A normal server sends data by just building up and uh, a large burst of frames. It puts a ton of its data in a descriptor ring, in a, in a thread, handles that, puts it in, a, in, in the flow, and says, okay, I'm done, then the next thread or application comes builds the next flow and puts it in chunks. That's how it works. It's not uh, interleaving. You say, okay, I get some from this, from this, from this. It's just how the threads and the model in the CPU work, how this comes. So then he places these class AQs ahead of frames uh, intended for flow two and flow three. So they are just uh, jumps, uh, chunks of it. So now the bridge one which is out there on the left side, uh, will receive the flow one burst at 220 megabit. Although this is only uh, a flow two for two megabits, but it will come with 222 megabits because it's in a traffic in a class shaper. So this means it will get much more data than it can eat up uh, as the two megabits and in the most commonly it will lose frames. Even though we say we have a class shaper, why do we still lose frames? But we lose the frames because the class is an aggregate of all flows in the class. So here is a comparison of if you would do the same work with a per flow credit-based shaper and then a class shaper or just a class shaper in a talker. So in one time slot, as I said, in a CPU, uh, the, it will uh, burst two megabit packets to end station B. That's what we would like to do, right? And uh, in, in the left side, you see the per, fl per flow approach. The talker models the frame to go to flow one. Flow one CBS release them with two megabits to the class uh, shaper. On the right side, the frame are modeled and push, put only in the class queue, but the class queue has 222 megabit as a speed to release these frames. So if they are there and even a two megabit stream, they will have bursted out on 222 megabit, which creates a problem in the subsequent bridge. 
So in the next time slot, the CPU starts with the 200 megabit flow and uh, for end station B, P. So the talker again on the left side, it puts them in the queue and the CBS releases them with the flow uh, shaping of 200 megabit, which it is supposed to go out into the class shaper. On the right side, again, the problem, it's 200 megabit, but 222 class shaping. So when it comes in, it will be sent out with 222 megabit. And the last one, so you see there, on the left side, flow one is two megabit, flow three is 200 megabit, as it's supposed to do. On the right side, every flow will have only the class shaping speed of 222 megabit, which will, in most cases, overrun a bridge. So here are some common questions about Talker CBS and why it should be there. The, the simple question would be, people would say, hey, why don't you add more buffers into your bridges? Okay, if someone here can predict me 100% how many buffers I need for which ratio between the ports, that would be really great. It doesn't work because I cannot predict which speeds talk to which one and when they, they get stopped. And, I, and silicon die size costs money. And I cannot put endless buffers there. I need to solve the problem on a system level. If I want a flow to be two megabit from the talker to the source, then I have to ensure that this happens and not say some idiot in between can talk whatever he wants, but the bridge has to compensate with buffering that and paying the cost for it. So that's not how it works and also not how the rest of TSN works. That's how we have to solve that problem. So, and the, the thing is, what is the purpose of having an additional class shaper in, in uh, CBS in the talker after the flow shaper? So the, as we have in, in the example, we have three, if we would have three flows with 30 megabit, class A, which is 90 megabit, the, the class A shaper would really help to spread the frames and deburst them uh, over the time. So that is the purpose of having the class shaper after the flow shaper. So how does this overall solve congestion? If the talker transmits each flow in the intended rate, congestion points in a bridge, subsequent bridges are de-stressed. You don't have a problem and ask these guys to have a ton of buffers to solve your problem that you're misbehaving on top. So the only really remaining congestion are any single lower priority interfering frames and frames are the same priority. But this is something where original bridge buffers were designed for. That is the problem they are supposed to solve. Temporary uh, peaks, but not permanent peaks and permanent misbehavior. So the, the typical pr uh, question which would come up, can QCR solve that problem? An asynchronous traffic shaper solve that? Yeah, it's a great feature, but it limits also the flows. So any burst, a non-aligned be, uh, behavior will still blow out the buffers. So it's always a point of losing buffers and losing buffers means uh, failing uh, and dropping frames. So here, a summary and a conclusion, what uh, we discussed a lot and uh, which Don put in the material and uh, I have to really give him a lot of credits to that. And unfortunately it cannot travel today, but hopefully in the next conference we will have it here, him here. So the talker per flow rate transmission solved the problem. And the credit based shaper is the only TSN tool so not the legacy enterprise Ethernet trials, the only reliable TSN tool defined for the talker per flow rate control. So CBS was standardized the original credit-based shaper in 2009. So it's there, it's mature, it's running. And for doing all that, you don't need time aware shaper. You don't need PTP to run, to be synchronized. It's just working with credit and flow-based shaping. So the, the per flow CBS does not always require hardware because it is a frames per second problem. If I can ensure frames per second are coming con constantly in my sender, in my talker, I can also solve the problem. 
For example, there are, there are a couple of examples or uh, sensors, for example, which don't run in the problem. A microphone collects samples, builds a frame, collects the next samples over the time in a time period, builds a frame. It won't have a burst. It will have constant sending rate. But what it is, it's implicitly already per flow shaped because it's constantly sending the data rate of its flow. So the question is, do bridges need CBS in a network? So CBS, as we said, they will allow small bursts and to catch up. And there are reasons where, they are, where CBS in bridges is needed. And the per, per class CBS definitely is a function of bridges. It debursts, small bursts, and uh, does just work. And it's a perfect solution. But in, in the opinion, and that's the statement from Don, and I fully support that in, the opi in our opinion, due to the small size of automotive network. And I assume seven hops still as a small size compared to enterprise networks. The per flow talker CBS is all that is required if the bridge hops are a few. So as the talker is really the critical place for that problem. And the talkers, if you all go back and look at your Mac implementations in uh, CPUs and in micros and so on, and we do the same in our NXP solutions, and we look at that and we will make sure that we will have a per flow shaping and then a per class shaping in all our devices to avoid legacy problems of overrunning bridges and losing frames. So that's all, I think, what as a summary I can give here. And just look at your products and look at your flow on the system side and you will see and can go through the presentation to the examples again that that is from an automotive or TSN network from our point the only solution. Okay, thank you very much, Manfred. So we have one question from the online audience. I have a question too. I can maybe ask before. Uh, could you could you um, you sort of mention? I mean, you could you repeat where in in what products exactly at what point this per flow shaper would need to be provided for? So it's anywhere where you are creating a stream. So I wouldn't say in a normal sensor, as we say, microphones and so on, because these kind of sensors are already de facto shaping themselves by the data rate and the timeouts when they're creating samples. But for example, any kind of center CPU, even uh, where, you, where you start doing a firmware update. If you do a firmware update from a micro to a bridge, your application for doing a firmware update could be connected with a gig or 2.5 gig into a switch. But your next ECU may only be a 100 megabit. It has a delta. But the application doesn't know anything about shaping. The application has a socket and starts mm -hmm. sending. For example, in UDP stream, here is my firmware image. And it puts it in descriptor rings and sends all that stuff out on the network with 2.5 gig. And then the bridge, the next hop gets to the mess. And if, it's, uh, if it already has in that CPU a class shaper, also that, as we saw, didn't solve the whole problem if you have multiple streams coming in. Mm -hmm. Because then the, sli the slower one will suffer because their path to the network will be congestion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we have the online question. We do. We have a question from Oliver Crichton. And he asked, a typical concern in automotive is latency, sometimes more so than bandwidth. How does talker-based CBS affect a low bandwidth yet low latency needed communication pattern. For example, if every listener on the network should get the same event as quickly as possible. So I think what we, what we ensure here is we get it with the same latency as we wouldn't do the shaping or nearly the same latency. The problem is we don't lose frames. Or the, the, the point is we don't lose frames. We still get the data through. We get it to the destination. If you want your low latency, then you need to have uh, your, your priorities set up correctly and your flow that you don't get concurrent uh, competition from other flows and get pushed back with that. But I think to get through that problem, the latency problem is and how you engineer on your network for latency. And uh, e even if you engineer your network correctly, 
on, on everything, your first talker misbehaving can break everything behind that, even if you engineered every TSN bridge correctly up to the end. That's all we have online. Okay, great. Any, I don't see any other questions up in the room, none more online. Then thank you very much, Manfred, for presenting us.